Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, Although heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, although all the earth with everything that is in it belongs to the Lord your God, God set his heart in love for you. Set his heart in love for you and chose you. Chose you. This morning we're going to talk about a, a particular spiritual discipline. And before we do that, before we talk about that, there are a couple things I want to sort of preface that with. And one is for us to understand what it is that a spiritual discipline, in fact, is. What does that involve? And um, in his book, uh, An Invitation, Invitation to a Journey, Robert Mulholland writes these words about spiritual formation and spiritual dis disciplines. He says, spiritual formation is a process of being conformed to the image of Christ, a journey into becoming persons of compassion, persons who forgive, persons who care deeply for others and the world, persons who offer themselves to God to become agents of divine grace in the lives of others and in their world. In brief, persons who love and serve as Jesus did. Persons who love and serve as Jesus did. That's part of that spiritual formation, spiritual discipline. Another thing that I, I know to be true when we practice any type of spiritual discipline is that it involves a certain level of trust that many times we are uncomfortable with. A level of trust in saying, this is my desired outcome, God, but I'm trusting you no matter the outcome. You know, in my own, um, my own life right now, my own personal life and experiences, I, I'm, I'm in the midst of this, and, and deeply so, um, in trusting. I have, um, well, this week I will leave on Wednesday, and I will return to San Antonio on Saturday evening, and I will spend all of that time at MD Anderson with two people that I love very dearly. One is my stepfather, who's having surgery on Friday and has been told is very high risk, the second is for a friend of mine that we've been friends for over 42 years, whom I love so deeply, and who is undergoing some massive treatments at MD Anderson right now. And so I'm praying for both of these people. I love both of these people. I have a desired outcome. I want my stepdad, Lonnie, and my sweet, sweet friend, Mark, to be okay. I want... I have a desired outcome. I'm praying specifically for that outcome. And, and I'm trusting God. And Mark's, Mark's wife, Debbie, is trusting God um, in the outcome. And so sometimes when we practice any type of spiritual discipline, it requires a level of trust that we might find uneasy or uncomfortable. And we may tell ourselves this particular spiritual discipline is one that doesn't fit me, doesn't work for me, isn't one I want to practice necessarily. But the question is, in all of our lives, how are we becoming persons who love and serve as Jesus did? How do we live and respond our lives in our lives? How do we live and serve the same way that Jesus did? And this morning, I want us to dig deeply into the spiritual discipline of tithing. And I know that that's a hard thing to hear about and a hard thing to talk about. And the moment some people hear the preacher say that, they're like, oh, great. She's going to talk about money. Um, and sometimes that's how I look at it, too, when I know that this, we're going to talk about, oh, great. I'm going to talk about money. Uh, but it's so much more than that. It's about so much more than that. Uh, as, as much as I know how to stress to you, I'm stressing to you this morning that we as disciples of Jesus Christ need to know about, talk about, be aware of, and be living out the spiritual discipline of tithing. Those of us who call ourselves disciples of Christ, this should not be so uncomfortable for us to hear about and talk about for our own spiritual good. For our own spiritual good, let's just get over ourselves and our love for money and come to the realization that it really isn't about how much you have or how much you do not have. It's really all about your attitude toward it. It's all about your attitude toward it. As a matter of fact, your attitude toward money will largely dictate and determine your attitude toward the spiritual discipline of tithing. It just stands to reason. It stands to reason. 
If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn to the Old Testament book of Malachi. We're going to be looking. It's the last book in the Old Testament, all right before Matthew. We're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. I would invite you to stand as you hear and as you receive into your heart the word of God. Let's stand together. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and in your offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. I will rebuke the locust for you, so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil. And if your vine in the field shall not be barren, says the Lord of hosts, then all nations will count you happy, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and let's pray together. God, we do pray this morning that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts, hearts that are just very open to this, this scripture and open to your word about it. And hearts that are kind of hardened to it. Speak to all of us. Let us be people who strive very diligently to live our lives the way Jesus would have us live. We pray these things in his name. Amen. So stewardship is an act of worship, and it's, it's our act of worship. It's even our act of gratitude toward God for all that he's done for us and for all that he's given us. The way that we treat the things that we have are our act of worship toward God. As a matter of fact, if we begin to see everything we have as already belonging to God, it's certainly going to change the decisions that we make about our resources. If we see everything we have as something that God has given to us and trusted us with, then it's going to change how we spend our money, how we treat one another, how we do everything, everything we have belonging to God. But see, when you look at national trends, which I kind of tend to like to do, well, it doesn't appear to me that we're living in a country made up largely of people who believe that everything they have belongs to God. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Currently, the average credit card debt per U.S. household is $15,270. That, that's not talking about cars and houses. That's credit card debt. Americans owe $856.9 billion in credit card debt. This is based on the American household credit card debt statistics. According to the National Resources Defense Council, Americans waste $165 billion annually by tossing away unwanted snacks and meals. The math works out to approximately $529 per person each year. According to CNN, Americans spend $66.5 billion on lottery tickets every year. And it's increasing every year since its inception. So, just as a little side note about the lottery, I just thought this was interesting and I thought you might find it fun. The Huffington Huffington Post claims that a person's chance of winning the lottery on a single ticket is 1 in 175 million. So to put that really into perspective, the odds of getting struck by lightning in your lifetime, being injured by your toilet seat this year, Getting killed by a shark and killed by an asteroid or comet are much more likely than winning the lottery. Just thought you'd want to know that. To give you an idea of how lucrative the gambling havens are in this country, casinos earned a gross revenue of $125 billion in the year 2010. So it seems to me that there's a pretty good possibility that we're living in a time And in a culture that does not see and believe that everything we have belongs to God. 
it's clearly not giving, affecting our decisions about our resources. So it brings up some questions for me, and one of them is: is why, why is it that we, um, why is it that we we find it joyful? to give to the people that we love and that love us. And we find, we experience consternation just in talking about giving and returning to God what he has blessed us with. Why does that, why does that bother us so much? Why do I spend more time thinking about how much I'm going to tip the person who brought me my chips and salsa and enchiladas than I think about how much I'm going to return to God? Is that happening for us? Is, is, is that not a problem for us, I think we'd rather talk about just about anything rather than talk about money. Even if it's like socially unacceptable, talk about it. Just don't talk about this. Uh, we've become more concerned about ourselves than we are about recognizing that everything we have belongs to God. Now, let me tell you, when I was a kid, Halloween was seriously my, my least favorite holiday of the year. I did not like Halloween. And it wasn't because I was scared. It was because I didn't want to go knock on somebody's door and beg them for candy. I thought that was just ridiculous. The, whatever it is in me that doesn't like to ask for help also doesn't like to ask for stuff, you know? And so it just didn't make sense to me. So I didn't want to dress up. I didn't want to go beg. And I, I'd, sometimes I'd just tell my brother, give me your baseball uniform and cap and let's go. And we'd go trick or treat. It, and this is what my parents kind of taught us. If you, if you wanted something, then you would do some extra chores or you'd mow somebody's lawn or something and earn some money and then go buy whatever it is you want. Like take, for instance, candy. It, I would have never knocked on someone's door and been like, hey, can you just give me some money so I can get some of those new, rib new ribbons for my bicycle handlebars and don't even try to tell me those things aren't crazy cool. But it didn't make sense. I wouldn't have done that. So why would I go knock on somebody's door and be like, oh, can I please have some candy? But I got to tell you the truth. My love for candy won. <laughs> it won. For free candy, it won. And my brother and I went trick-or-treating every single year. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Americans spent approximately 2.4 billion billion dollars on Halloween candy last year. So when I first became a pastor, this dislike for asking for things trickled into that being a pastor. I was in student ministry for a long time and I became a pastor and then and uh, as an associate pastor, the senior pastor would talk to me and say, "Oh, we're getting ready for a stewardship campaign." And I would just kind of get sick to my stomach. It's like, am I going to have to ask people for stuff? Am I going to have to ask people to give? Well, yes, that's what you're going to need to do. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be gone on that Sunday. <laughs> uh, that whole stewardship campaign got to be out of the country for that time. And honestly, like for every stewardship sermon that I ever preached, when I first started out in ministry, I would start the sermon out with like lots of apologies. This is how I would start. I'd be like, hey. We're going to talk about money today. I'm so sorry. If you're a visitor, please know we don't always talk about money. Please come back. Don't hate us. And, and, or I would say, okay, you know what? Everybody's at a different place with this whole tithing thing. So wherever you are, that's okay. And I've thought back about this because I've really changed in my attitude about this. But I think about that senior pastor that had to work with me in those beginning days. I should probably call him on the phone this afternoon and say, I'm really sorry. I was such a pain in your neck. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but I've changed, and, and, and I'm going to tell you about that a little bit later. Um, 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he's talking to them about the people who live in Macedonia. He's talking to them about the Macedonians, and this is what he writes about the people of Macedonia to the people of Corinth. He says, out of the most severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. You listen to this? These two don't go together. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty have welled up in rich generosity. This is striking what Paul writes because we don't tend to put those two things together. That someone could be experiencing the most severe trials of their life, be experiencing extreme poverty and overflowing joy and welling up in rich generosity. But Paul's kind of giving a mathematical equation here. He's saying these do live well together. Because here's the thing, friends. Here's the thing. People don't give 
because they have more money. That's not, not always the case. People give because they have more joy. People give because they have more passion, because they have more vision for the kingdom of God. People give because they come into this place in their lives where they trust God with every aspect of their lives, and they experience a tremendous amount of joy from that. Joy in the Lord is what motivates people to be a giving and generous people. Joy that comes from knowing the saving grace of Jesus Christ is what drives our desire to be disciples who practice the spiritual discipline of tithing. It's not obligation or guilt or a begging, pleading preacher or mere habit, albeit a good habit, but it's joy and it's trust. It's joy and it's trust. So what do you suppose it is that's changed my way of thinking about this where I can be at least not about to throw up when I'm standing up here talking to you about tithing. And that comfortable-ish talking to you about the spiritual discipline of tithing. What's changed in me? What do you suppose has taken place there? Because, I mean, to be completely, totally honest, I'm not 100% the most comfortable I've ever been in my life right now, but I am completely confident and who God calls us to be and what God calls us to do on this subject. So the first, one of the things was that I, I came to the realization that I wasn't asking for me, so that kind of helped. But really the two things that changed my attitude about this more than anything else, one, uh, both of them have to do with joy and trust, both of them. First of all, I see the joy that comes into people's lives when they experience the grace of Jesus Christ and when they learn to put their trust in him. The joy, I get to see that, whether it's the first time for them or the millionth time. That joy is evident and I get to see it. The church with all its flaws and all its need for change gets that right, I believe, more often than not. As a matter of fact, we have a family that <clears throat> began worshiping with us about three years ago. They're here. Emmett and Trisha Gronovic and their little girl, Sophie. When Sophie was born, uh, Emmett and Trisha uh, knew they needed to go somewhere to... Oh, they, by the way, I have their permission. I'm not like freaking them out right now. Um, they knew that they needed to go somewhere, that this, this gift that had been given to them by God was something they knew. They, they weren't deserving. They needed to go somewhere to thank God, and they walked through the doors of this church, praise God, and they were greeted by you. And now they're here like every Sunday and their little girl Sophie when she drives by here says, my church, my church. And I want to read to you a text that I received from Trisha. <clears throat> no, really, thank you. She says, we wholeheartedly committed our lives to the Lord three years ago. And he has enveloped our family with a shield of protection and rained down his love. We are not without struggles, not by far. But we no longer despair or feel hopeless in difficult circumstances because we have a personal relationship with Jesus. He lives in our hearts. Even three-year-old Sophie will tell you about that. We feel his presence daily and we yearn to know him more. She says, I, I used to pretend but I don't pretend anymore. She said, I pretended for a long time and that pretend world will never amount to the joy I have in the world with the real, true, living Christ. I get to see the joy in people's lives when they come into that understanding and that knowledge of the grace that Jesus has for them. And for stories like this to continue, the church must be made up of members and non-members alike who practice the spiritual discipline of tithing and who practice the spiritual discipline of trust. The second thing is I see the joy that comes into people's lives when they move from that place of, of um, a focus on self to that place of focus on God and on others. Focusing on Jesus and how he calls us to live out our lives. When people get out of the trap of, of hoarding, people get out of that, 
that wrong mentality of extreme self-preservation, and they allow Jesus to change and rearrange their hearts for the kingdom of God, man, that generosity produces a joy and a blessing like they never could have believed would be possible, like they never could have imagined would take place. And I'm going to tell you, if you've experienced this, then you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you know I'm telling the truth. And if you haven't experienced this, then you're not going to ever believe me until you move to that place. You won't be able to believe me until you experience it for yourself, until you experience it for yourself, until you begin to practice that discipline, until you begin to trust God with everything you are, everything that you have. Make no mistake, the love that God has for us is never changing. He is truly a good, good father. His faithfulness toward us endures forever. And yet, just like most of us, even in loving relationships, we can experience anger and disappointment. The people that we love sometimes anger us and disappointment and disappoint us. Can I get a witness? It happens, but that love for that person doesn't change. God's love for us never changes. But I'm going to tell you that this scripture tells us very clearly that when we rob God, it is a, an absolute turning away from God. Turning away from him. And this scripture says to us that selfishness is robbing God. It's a turning away from God. And what does God say to us? Return to me and I will return to you. Everything that we possess belongs to God. Everything. So remember when, when we think of it this way as everything that we have belonging to God, that it makes a difference in the decisions that we make about our God implores us, implores us to return to him. To trust him with everything. So I'm going to ask you this question this morning that I hope and pray that you will allow your heart and mind to really think about and explore. Are we robbing God with our tithes and our offerings? Or are we honoring God with our tithes and our offerings? Are we robbing God or are we honoring God? Um, I grew up singing a song in the church because I believe that in order for us to really honor God with our lives and every nook and cranny and aspect of our lives, it takes some pretty incredible trust. It does. And, and trust is a, it can be a very difficult thing for us. People have let us down. Have you heard people say, you know, you violated my trust and, it's, and you're going to have to re-earn it? I'm telling you, for the, for the person who's, who's had their trust violated, that's harder for them than the person who's trying to regain that trust. Trust can be a really difficult thing for us. When I was um, growing up, we used to sing this song in, in church called, um, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And I love the words to that song because it really speaks to the blessing, the blessing that we experience when we, when we truly trust in Jesus. The woman who wrote this, this song, her name, last name is Steed, and the Steed family was on a picnic, and the mother and father and their children, and um, I didn't know this story until Maggie shared it with me. Um, I love that Maggie looks these things up and pays so much attention to what these, where these lyrics came from. But they were on a picnic, and, and they heard a child drowning and the father jumped into the river as well and tried to save the child. And as a result, they both drowned. And this was a family of very little means. They didn't have a lot of money. And so this woman is raising these children by herself. And she's having a pretty difficult time. But at the same time, God just keeps placing people in her life who keep helping her and providing what she and her family needs. And she sits down and she writes the words to this song, "'Tis so sweet." to trust in Jesus. And I want, I want you to take a moment and just, I've asked Maggie and uh, Jeff and um, Robert to just sing the chorus of the song for, just, for us to just listen to. So just prepare your hearts for that and let your heart hear these words of trusting in Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how
morning, I'm going to set forth a challenge for you as a church and for you as individuals, as disciples of Jesus Christ. And that challenge is for the months of June, July, and August to begin tithing. To begin tithing for the months of June, July, and August. That's that challenge. I accepted this challenge some years ago and the blessing and the joy that's brought in my life. Unspeakable. Begin that. And then be looking and watching for the ways that you experience extreme joy over that generosity. And look for the ways that God blesses you the way that God pours out. And I'm not talking about that you start tithing and God gives you a brand new million dollar home. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about prosperity gospel here. I'm talking about the blessings that come when you know that you are living the way that Jesus has called you to live. And then I'm going to ask you to share those stories of blessing and those experiences of joy with me and, and with others as God fulfills this promise out of Scripture in your life of blessing and of joy. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward now for our time of offering. we'll have a moment where we can pray over this specific offering, but as this offering is passed and as you listen to Maggie and Jeff and Robert sing this song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, begin praying that whatever it is that's going on in your life that's holding you back from trusting God with everything, I mean everything, that you would, you would just begin praying that God would release that for you. Just open up those storehouses. I mean, just release you from that so that you can experience that blessing and that joy. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the ways in which you have blessed us with family, with church, with everything in our lives. It's just from you, God, and we thank you for that. And we pray, God, for this offering specifically this morning, that it would be used in a way that furthers your kingdom. Let, let it bring joy into the hearts and of people who don't know about your grace. Let it be used, Lord God, in such a way um, that one day we will know and we will see, God, your handiwork in all of it. Help us, God, to trust you in all things, to put our trust in Jesus. And that even when the outcomes are not perhaps what we desire, that we will continue, Lord God, to trust you and to live in your blessing. Together, God, we lift our voices and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.